Hello everyone, today we talk about the spread of uniforms in the second modern age, with particular reference at certain aspects that aside from the most obvious centralization of the supplying systems, um, uh, you know, the, the regularization of military clothing and so on, looks at other cultural factors that brought, uh, paradoxically, not in a, in a modernistic uh, sense, towards the, uh, in fact, the homogenization of, of the uniforms. Um, for, for this sake, actually, we should talk at some point about what we mean by uniform proper, because uh, it's easy to be dogmatic about terms, and this often happens, especially when, uh, you know, around modern age, where you can say modernistic studies this is a bit of a tendency that I've met, at least in some, in some studies, to, to say, you know, from 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 this time on, we the, this thing is born like the state, the uniform, the standardization, the centralization, as if these things had never existed before, or as if even during the modern age, actually they ever got to a level of fulfillment that actually is proper of the contemporary age. If anything, you could go as far as saying that not even today's soldiers actually are equipped all in the same way, if you don't want to make a counter-argument for uniformity. Um, and there is a bit of organism in there that tends also to say, okay, well, you know, what kind of uniform did these guys wear? And, and getting, you know, hyper-detailed about it, but not realizing sometimes that, you know, after a couple of months of campaigns, whichever thing you had at the beginning of it on you doesn't physically exist anymore. Right. You, you are, you're covered something else that uh, naturally at this time comes to be maybe, I don't, I don't know, a resupply, something that is, is more organized. But we, we don't have to be, you know, categorical saying, you know, before this time, actually, the uniform is born concretely as an idea in, in the modern age. Like, th it's better to say that there were certain political and social uh, possibilities that allowed the homogenization, the, the regularization in the homogenization of military equipment in many ways. And I, again, we will have to talk about this in, in on another occasion. I think we, we said something about logistics already in this regard, right? Some, some, something that actually went as banally saying that before these times that there hadn't been any corpse, for example, was deputed to simply the calculus of how many supplies were needed for an army previously, because normally armies lived off the land, or at least had a few supplies around that had other systems, contingental systems of supplies. Um, and even in here we have to understand the logic of it, the fact that what starts happening from especially the second half of the modern age is, is related to new needs, not um, the the idea that you know before it wasn't after all anything to to make it work, um, or that the simple needs that existed before hadn't uh, required other sometimes even more ingenious solutions at some point to solve what was in fact we have already defined as the good enough right in war you don't have to to have perfect armed forces you have to have those that naturally there is a, co a ratio cost benefits involved, but in fact what what is good enough, right, for the expenses and the effectiveness um of, of the whole thing. And we can date uh, uniformity and properly uniforms if you don't use the term dogmatically as as far as the the, the, the ancient world. Right? And even there there is properly not a you know, because I presume in tribal world or something conceptually but was there. That there was a a sort of uh, level of recognition that dates back to prehistory that obviously has to do with m more aspects than the ones that are just merely, you know, the equipment. It's also mm, visually broadly meant, but also uh, we've seen, made a video on the importance of uh, of music in warfare, of of even of uh, war cries and shouts and songs, etc. So this is all something that took its own time before becoming fully established and we just start observing as we will do now from the essentially the mid 17th century the appearance of um, you know more regularized systems of, of clothing supplies and an and armament that naturally go in parallel with the development of a more centralized and permanent and professional uh, army organization, and it's not a surprise, and in fact, the beginning of this all starts conventionally 
conventionally uh, with the new model army in England uh, during the, the Civil War uh, and in the Swedish army during the Thirty Years' War in, in countries that were essentially experimenting, uh, especially these ones actually ex novo, right? Because they never fully had, had, had them before, unlike greater powers like France or Spain, um, more, um, you know, eff effectively more centralized systems of recruiting, training, equipment, armament systems. Right. You know that the mo new model army eventually was kind of disbanded, like after the, the gl until the, the glorious revolution and probably the, the creation of the, of the of the English state. England will not have the the proper army that in fact starts to, to get it known from the time of Marlborough and the, the, the war of Spanish succession and so on and this, this, so these huge funds that now the, the same classes that had fought against the, the, the monarchy um, especially in, in London to the great merchants, bankers etc actually start paying you know having come to power so having you know put the monarchy literally aside, I mean, still in charge, namely, but de facto not so much, that the English state is, is overwhelmingly funded by, you know, if you look at the, the, the sheer um, amount of money that, that Charles I had required just for the ship money, you know, it's ridiculous in comparison to what now, uh, at, the beginning, at the end of actually of the 17th century, the, the English state was paying its army, right, and that in fact, is the moment in which England, that up to that point had remained actually second class and even marginal power in Europe, takes off to 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 gain the, the empire that we know from the especially the Seven Years' uh, War uh, period uh, onwards. And the same goes for Sweden, that actually has a freaking lot of money because of its um, essentially very carbon, a very you know, very steel, steel-like uh, iron that exports dramatically and will keep doing it, both for, you know, the, the war industry, essentially, in Europe during the Thirty Years' War, but also for England, um, and that starts centralizing in a state that even in there, up to the point, hadn't been that much, right? you know, second-rank power, easily. That, however, exactly for this reason, starts from centralizing from scratch in many ways, albeit you know, the, the system was already orderly in a, in a militia sense in many ways, and we'll have to, to look at that at some point. And creates properly a professional army. It is fully equipped. That is the one of the great victories of Gustavus Adolphus, that is one of the, the greatest, most complete military geniuses in, uh, in, in history, surely the greatest in Swedish history. So what did this change banally occur brought to, like... You know, in, in England, for example, starting from the 50s of the 17th century, within the new model army, was abandoned the idea of the camp ensigns, right? So, this signs of uh, distinction that were susceptible to get lost or to not even be noticed fundamentally, that countersigned the rank in which the single soldiers served, right, that were for this reason essentially dressed up to, up to that point as the, the rest of the enemies or right around that, like it had, as it had always been, right, that's why I said we should make a video explaining how the, the, the uniform system worked before what we conventionally call properly the, the uni modern uniform, um, and everything was naturally very very unregular, very very heterogeneous, and very often just even uh, you know the the consequence maybe of just a nobleman that decided to spend enough money to have his troops at least at the beginning of the campaign um, uniformly equipped. But uh, we're talking about companies, right? And we're talking about entire armies. And even in that case, if you look at the armies of Wallenstein, or you know this this the largest private armies were raised in that instance during the Thirty Years' War, and after all, the English Civil War is is uh, is connected uh, uh, at many levels to that, but uh, they weren't uniform either, right? And as we were saying before, the, the, that wasn't, like, kind of much of a problem after all, right? It's uh, Today we will not touch that topic, but speaking of tactics, for example, uh, it's obvious that these new 
uniformity was was functional also to new tactical needs it wasn't just a matter of you know finally needing in a progressive sense as if these guys had dreamt of it from from uh, the the beginning of times to have all uniformly clothed troops no there, there was now practical need i mean the idea that for example a regiment had to be much more um you know readily identifiable on the field for the sake of maneuvering uh for you know um for this ever more elaborated operations that also in the uniform uh, as colors properly um imbued troops of a sense of uh, of a determination in a way aside from the spirit of corp and you know the the obvious identification with the colors with the insignia but properly the idea of showing the enemy that you had this compact uh uniform mass of troops that now was much more dynamic like until bike and shot was the normality on the field after all warfare was was pretty slow and bulky Right, we've seen it were these essentially slow formations of pikemen that had to to push through, supported by by musketry fire. And but the, the cavalry was uh, was actually important. You know, it's often uh, the role of cavalry during pike and shock times is often overlooked and somewhat minimized. But it was still actually very very dynamic and offensive. But you know, it was definitely a, a, a much slower, uh, spatially speaking. Uh, warfare, then it would become the one of the end of the, the 17th, the, the beginning of the 18th century. So uh, it's obvious that this all has a also a psychological function of you know committing more of these troops, even just to the new uh, the new audacity, this new uh, you know obedience of what's required to the troops of moving faster, performing uh, a you know to be more readily, more more dynamic, more vital, more or quick to react even on the field. And colors can do a great lot. There are scientific studies that tell you know if you're if you wear a certain color, uh you you objectively feel in a different way. And this is absolutely true. Kind of notice it if you uh if you're interested. And um so it's in this England of the mid seventeenth century that began the regularization, if not exactly already of the design but at least of the color of the uniforms this is also very important and it uh, actually emphasizes the graduality that we were talking about before because uh, since uh, since ancient times we we know of normally uh, states like think about the roman empire said okay we need you know a, a company a regiment commander which said okay we need a certain amount of clothing of a certain color Right, and then we have to buy it. And normally, the troops were were provided with this, and they had to sew the the uniform on their own. So that the problem wasn't much actually. I mean, there were probably some some guidelines, even for what they had to look like as indumentaries, as proper uh, pieces of clothing. But the, the important was the color. Most it was the cloth, which also costed a lot. Consider the costs. Don't think that these were in still at this point in pre-industrial times. Uh, easy expanses to fill. Don't think, for example, the Roman Empire had, with all the expanses it, it had had, had you know so much to care about what its troops, uh, whether troops, troops were already already wearing a certain color. This, these were things that happened, if anything, I don't know, at the level of a cohort, uh, a company level, um, and it, even in there, they corresponded to, to 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 the needs of the warfare of the time. We made videos actually on the so-called uniforms in the Roman army. We've made actually a couple of videos. I think one sh surely we made a clothing of the uh, tertio, uh, of the Spanish tertio that uh, illustrates part of of the problem. Actually, in, in a slightly uh, slightly previous times compared to this one, in spite basically the same uniformation was happening. The Spanish army this time, more or less as these other countries were doing. So basically, as all the countries in Europe, there is a dramatic homogeneity in Europe. In this regard, in terms of tactical achievements, especially uh, excuse me, in uh, uniforming uh, achievements, also tactical achievements, they they go in parallel properly. So all Western Europe fundamentally uh, can you know you can't see powers that are more powerful, more resourceful. Um, you know you can look at the, the giant that France is becoming, or even the tiniest uh, German principality somewhere uh, in Central Europe. But fundamentally, the, the way they fight is identical. Like Western Europeans basically fight all in the same way, and 
um, so this homogenizing process touches a bit everybody in, in this regard. And in England, famously enough, the uh, color was adopted largely for the coats was red, right? However, there was this use of lining the interior of the clothes with, uh, cl in fact, textiles of different colors, so that the, uh, the the essentially the cuffs, right, were uh, could give a, a a different chromatic tone to the single units. Right, this would remain, uh, as you know, the, the, in 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 this identifying sense that you understand that point. It's not uh, just about having one single color, but actually the regiment here is going to be the, the most important unit, the one with which you identify. In that constitutes a bit like an army on its own, like in the sense that uh, that's fundamentally also what the, the greatest organic continuity. Uh, happens, you know, there are historical uh, regiments, in fact, they were born mostly in this time, in most um, Western European countries, also quite famously, and they were, by the way, um, ha either hired or probably recruited or commissioned most of the time, so it still happened through mo largely a private uh, channel, in a way, at least the sovereign gave a certain commission to, to a nobleman usually, and then the nobleman pay, essentially received this money that most of the times wasn't even enough right, for equipping all the troops, but naturally the nobleman was committed uh, at that point for political interests on its own to participate to that uh, entourage, and uh, the royal entourage and being part of you know the, the games of power, so that he would naturally invest also his own private funds for fill, for filling these troops. Uh, this is how the whole thing began. We've seen it, you know, this dramatic problem of the. This is how the centralized state happens. Like we think a centralized state happens one day, one one monarch is kind of a mm, worse ass than the others. The set arrives there with iron fist, smashes everyone, and centralizes everything. You know, this actually happened by essentially making this the, all these nobles around you co competing for uh, getting your favor and you're still largely depending on them. We made a video last summer was uh, the uh, the one about um, uh, Edmund of, of, of Alfarache that uh, showed in, at least in the, the Spanish rogue right, in, in, in the, ro the novel. Uh, it is very very realistic. It was written at the time if a person that also knew the military environment pretty well shows that this constant and unavoidable misery of everybody involved in modern warfare, like these people were chronically short of money uh, at every single damn moment, starting from the sovereigns to the single soldiers. But still, you know, there was something to, to scratch off of this, after all, between loot or other, you know, ways of just surviving. Right. This is a world that is uh, has problems with. If you look at the video we made last year, also last uh, winter last year about the French uh, Dragonnade, that actually deal with a problem was happening in a country was making it was more advanced in terms of centralization. That is Louis XIV France, right? Creates the first properly modern army as we intended today, and still used to. You know this. Uh, you know, think of building the troops in in that case in the in the communities of the of the Huguenots, right, of France before they were finally expelled after the revocation of the last revocation, at least of the Edict of Nantes. And and it sees in there, you know, the the sheer still aside from the mixed reality. I mean, the the, the first barracks were being born in, but at the same time, this this normal building was was happening. Uh, on a regular basis as well. And it was a problem because, you know, think about even the times. You know, if you read the, the, the Dumas, uh, the, 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 you know, the adventures of the Musketeers, all of these kind of barely, uh, barely legal kind of uh, and royally regulated reality that still the, 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 the mid of this, uh, the, in that case, at least the first half of the 17th century was, right? And and there is a, a great deal of, in fact, also of mentality that we should describe in this regard. Maybe we will touch it at the end of the video regarding the, in fact, the the relics that, of of this, 
I would say medieval if I wasn't, you know, so triggered by the term as a medievalist myself. But I mean, this relics of the more warrior, the warlike, you know, uh, warrior-like properly past that still survived. It actually, uh, even today, right, in some uniforms that have that that, uh, for example, ethnic touch or still, you know, this frills, this elements of distinction that think about the kilt. Think about it was all things that date back to a period at that point you can date to the Middle Ages, if not before actually, to a tribal context that shows the survival of this previous mindset and edits and and traditions also uh, for up to today and at the time was naturally even stronger still. The uniformity was the novelty here. Right. Uh the infantries of the Sun King, the French army, a few times later, were distinguished by the gray of their clothing, while the mounted infantry, the dragoons, by the red, right? Uh, at least when they didn't belong to units that were at the order of a member of the French royal family, because in that case, the uh, azur was used, was, you know, the, the French national color at the time and that you find even I don't know the, the musketeers in uh, so uh, the, the royal musketeers at least and uh, and that therefore shows already and, and considered that the nobility in this regard still as we were saying before was very like they, they could go into battle like the, the colors that they, they wished in many ways there's still a, a great feudal edus in spite this was being uh, reduced by the centralization at Versailles from a merely political point of view but properly you know the cults of arms the, yeah, the, the nobility of the of chivalry was still pretty much alive and all these colors were properly very that they, they, it's what identified the same honor of these people and the noblemen that we are here in the Ancien Regime. It's the noblemen that make war. Right? The war is a kind of a aristocratic sport, still seen like. You know, the reality of warfare is drawing to, towards another thing. And in fact, the France of the Sun King shows exactly this. And uh, in many ways, it's what, you know, one century afterwards would have brought to the French Revolution and the creation of uh, a national statal armies in this regard. The the obvious need and increase of uh, of a of a mass army, something that that uh, maybe mass armies are too big board considering you know how we use mass society t terminologically in the contemporary age, but you know of troops now that are not just you know a bunch of you know red followers of, of of the noblemen right brings on the field that they are subjects. Right in, in in larger and larger numbers, commoners that are given muskets or are given power that have never been seen before. This naturally goes in parallel also with the growth of middle classes. Think about the the, the great um, uh, French investments in uh, in the industries and all this, and uh, what what will pay in fact that the same. French army as we know at the time of Sun King that is literally you know what all the other Europeans have to get together against in order to prevent France taking over all of Europe as it would actually happen in Napoleonic times proving the, the enormous p potential if anything demographic agricultural of this country so from this time onwards with infinite variants especially at the beginning, of course, certain colors became characteristic of the armies of as many countries. Light blue for the Dutch and the Bavarians, the blue, the famous Prussian blue for, in fact, the Prussians, that during the American War of Independence would have been passed to the rebel colonists and that eventually would have become a characteristic of the French Republican armies. We have already seen the most famous red for the English. Uh, also white was uh, characteristic enough, especially used by the Austrians, and the green adopted by the Russians. However, as we were saying before, aside from the color, the uniforms remained for a long time a regimental rather than a national fact that was particularly evident in the English private regiments, and together 
with the use of the parade pace of the musical marches of the insignia and so on the uniform became however one of the uh, those elements were destined to create in the uh, in, in the viewers the picture of military units as something powerful at the same time harmonious right this is as we were saying before particularly important that also the, the drill the training the the the, the maneuvers uh, at this point were increasing they were uh, these were great even spectacles right something that is pictured even in uh, think about i don't know the think of, at the beginning of berlin right you see even for for the local communities it was a show to see uh, the, the the regiment that arrived or was the, the local one was training right and um and everything was like like a show and it was ever more performed exactly because there was a way now to to pay troops regularly for doing so and uh, increasing the standards and, and making it even a choreographed thing right think about what the, the stereotype in fact of 18th century war for these um, you know un, unwavering uh, troops that even under you know cannon artillery fire musketry fire they, they would stand firm at their place they would move orderly naturally this is a bit it's not so much of a myth because naturally linear tactics function properly like that but of course you could see easily on a battlefield this this troops breaking the line and running to to a, a storm a position right and you know the only ones to they wouldn't do it at the risk actually at, not even at risk but it, you know with the consequence of paying tremendous losses I mean where the Prussians that had to march always at the same speed even if it was crazy to do so because it would they could have simply overrun whoever was in front of them in that case instead they they, they would take all the enemy shots uh they, it, it it took to but by 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 marching always at the same on speed without breaking ever the line in you know, this strictly absolutistic geometrical principle, but that was part of you know, the same uh, that rigidity was part probably of the same identitarism in that regard it was all one with the with the insignia with the regiment with the esprit de corps uh, and so on. And naturally, with the 18th century. Uh, there was a bit of a, an homologation of, of the of the fashion uh, of the appearance as we were saying before this was also kind of a european wide thing uh, and this is with the exception of the special units where certain origins especially ethno folkloristic ones were respected and came to be part of a venerable tradition that often as we were saying before has come at least in part uh, up uh, almost at least up to our own days think about the kilt and the claymore of the scottish fusiliers for example the montero headgear for the dragoons the the jacket with the you know the, the inside of, of for of leopard skin for the for the usars the mirliton and the totenkopf distinctive the skull for the users of death that appeared in the Prussian army around the 40s of the 18th century and the symbol of of the corp um, meant uh, it seems at least their contempt for for death but from which it's not extraneous um, a perhaps an occultistic illusion of masonic type but on the various interpretations that have been advanced or that can be more or less imaginific, some some bottom about the uniforms. There is all a, an enormous literature that we should look into maybe at some point. And for example, at the time it was a common belief that red or the dark colors were used because in this way the wounded soldiers, without seeing the stain of blood widening on their clothes, would remain more calm, right? And uh, this actually doesn't explain. The, uh, the the sky blue jackets of the Bavarians or the gray or white ones of the French. And aside from possibilities of this type that are to be found historically, think about the, the idea that, I don't know, even the Spartans uh, somewhat wore red, preferably even the Romans in the explanation has always been saying they had to conceal blood. But, you know, aside from the fact that, you know, 
in battle, especially in those times, everybody was literally covered in blood, <laughs> right? And this this time it wasn't anything either. You know, think about limbs flying off. You know, people. You know, you can't imagine the, what the the the, the plain butchery of of mitraille or you know ricochet uh, cannonball, uh, ricocheting cannonballs among the the the, the thickly packed musketeer ranks could could produce in here. So the idea is. What are we talking about? Are, are, can't we widen, you know, the, the 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 range of possibility from from something that that goes beyond a, a, a merely mechanicistic reason? This is the problem that we often don't take uh, in, into account. Uh, there is one aspect that has to do with uh, far symbological elements. But um, that can more easily be observed, for example, in the cultural background of Europe at the time. Um, naturally, from one side, the uh, homogeneous colors of the uniforms are the natural outcome of the system of centralization of military supplies and therefore the uh, mass um, acquisitions of textiles in industrial quantities by now by the 18th century but th there is another aspect that has to do with moral values of if you want military moralism that we can't lightly touch on that has to do for example with the counter-reformistic or Christian reformed uh, side of, of the story right we, we should consider that the, the elimination for example of the various frills of the a warrior clothing happened exactly in one age in which also the civilian costume became extremely more austere right the first half of the 17th century was properly at the age of confessional wars in Europe but second half of the 17th and the 18th century uh, so the full institutionalization of a specific confessional identity in the various European states that now were uniforming in many ways, either you were Catholic or you were Protestant, and, and there was this competition of who was kind of the more austere, the more uh, Christ-like, that sense of simplicity, uh, the lack of this, uh, you know, uh, luxurious, uh, expansive looks. It was typical of, of the warrior back in the day. It fights essentially for his own charisma, for his own power, all, all you know, um, warlike ideas that are very, very pagan in legacy, and that are literally the, what existed up to that point. Right? There is no, absolutely no doubt of any sort, right, of of this, and um, and and therefore this is uh, actually another interesting key of interpretation. But and there are also romantic suggestions that lived on a bit in the symbolism that we mostly interiorize, in fact, from the 19th century about these pictures of the Schwarzreiter, the black knights, you know, these uh, pictures of dark, shady adventures in which the, especially Central European fantasies uh, style, you know, say, Erich von Stroheim style, for example, evoke um, with such name, and, and fantasy runs immediately to the Lugabrews, uh, uniforms of the uh, infantry regiment of the Duke of Brunswick that overthrown from his duchy by N N Napoleon was so uh, thirsty of revenge to clothe his soldiers with, uh, with a completely black uniform that was just orned just with a symbol of the uh, of the unit it was in fact the, the silver Totenkopf and uh, this is famous also uh, because of the dark Frederick William of Brunswick that in fact deserved the epithet of Schwarzer Herzog, so the, 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 the Black Duke. But the good Schwarzreiter of the 17th century were something very different, for example. They, they were normal pistoliers that practiced the caracal tactics. They had nothing to do with the, properly at least, in an entry fashion with contempt for death of the Prussian users, uh, nor to the uh, thirst of revenge of the Duke of Brunswick, right? So the, the fact that, mm, as, you know, good uh, mounted pistol years brought the cuirass, 
that even if it was just reduced to the chest and the back in some way and to and, and therefore for in order to eliminate the 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 annoying and even dangerous effect of reflection they painted it with greasy black paint right so practical purpose this is true also from the black knights of the, the middle ages that was just the the darkened uh, the, the burnished armor right for uh, preventing uh, that prevented uh, oxi oxidation right and it, but so we can't even detach completely these these connections between symbolism and so on but definitely there is also to always to realize that what we think most of the times about these pre 19th century world that in many ways i think more than the 18th century i mean the 18th century had so you know this dramatic uh path of secularization and you know the industrial revolution and uh, a, a great uh, gentrification in many ways of especially naturally in in England in France but take central Europe take eastern Europe right these were realities that uh, you know in Russia they, they, they came out of the, the middle ages in many ways with with 1917 so and not even in the, in, in the best ways uh, as you as you know um, and and the point is that these worlds lived completely with the, the stories, the minds, the, the, the symbolism in, in these archaic realities, right? It, it is partly, you know, modernity in this sense is the exception. That's why at the beginning of the video I was trying to, you know, to warn you from saying, okay, look, yeah, we, we think about modern, the modern era, but if we were to look at it, in my opinion, actually it's the 19th century that really creates, you know, truly, at least, at least fully Western European dimension with the industrialization of, of other countries. Um, with with Germany or Italy or you know uh, other realities that pro from from which progressively you know the 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 modernity spreads, nation state spreads, and so on, that we can talk of having coming out of the of the ancien regime proper, having coming out of the Middle Ages proper, right? The the modern ages, this kind of um, extraneous body we invented in historiography to define actually a process that shouldn't be a big deal right you know the, the modern age is mostly conceived in function of the contemporary age historiographically speaking but most of it it's actually middle ages like me medieval the middle age medieval warfare to me really ends either in, in this broader range of time that goes from 1789 to 1980 right that's when in europe the Middle Ages died, right? As as a system of warfare, because the ancien regime, to think of the nobleman commanding the army, it's a whole, it's a whole political and social system working. These were things still standing in in the Second German Empire, in Austria Hungary, in Tsarist Russia. You know, they they were worlds that lived so much more closely to what we think of the Middle Ages that we actually think of uh, of of our own times, right? And and it's recent. Uh, it's a recent past, right? It's barely more than one century ago. And and this is uh, also we, we could digress endlessly because it was actually one of my favorite topics. But um, th there is also to to say that we uh, we we still see, and this is the point where I was making now that we still even look at warfare in ways that have been somewhat romanticized in the 19th century uh, also for previous times right that with realities that hi uh, actually hid much more practical reality right the example of the pistol years of the Schwarzreiter of the 17th century that they are much more modern uh, or at least that we, we provide actually a much more secular uh, explanation for the reason why they, for which they blackened their their armor, right? It's something that was reinvented later on, by the time of the Duke of Brunswick and the, you know, all the German um, idealism and uh, romanticism, this recall for national values, the the, 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 all, the the Middle Ages, right? So you have to be very very careful about what we we look at. Right, because very often, actually, reality lays in between, right? But but you can't be sure it's never either from one extreme, from one extreme or another. Like every 
extremization, every absolutization, the historical judgment is by definition wrong. Uh, but in, in the research for the concreteness of the historical reality, that there lays the 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 real balance, right? But this is just a digression. So I hope it was interesting. Um, uh, as we were saying before, we will come back on the issue of uniforms and also on these other kind of symbological, uh, ethnic, folkloristic, uh, national characters that were distinguishing even local warfare, in fact, from one another. Right. Recently, we talked about the Usars, the the uh, the the dragoons, all these other the the Ulans, all these ethnic units how they came to be, what they became by 18th century warfare, what were, in fact, not in, in their previous medieval, mostly, uh, origins, right? You know, their ties, even the culture of the steps and so on. But once again, we'll see it another, another time. All right, so for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like. Or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.